counter plans. Who are they? Can we trust them? Well, that's what we're going to find out in today's uh, lecture. I'm going to try something um, new, and then you can tell me whether that new thing sucks or not. <laughs> okay, um, all right. This is what I'm trying out. Um, I'm going to be honest, I don't I don't like it. <laughs> I don't think it looks good. But um, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to do it. And um, you know, I'm not going to not do it now. So let's talk about counter plans. I made this, um, most of this, I added a couple slides like yesterday. Uh, but I made this lecture, this, 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 this uh, PowerPoint, um, a long time ago, like a year ago. So I'm not, you're going to see a couple moments where, uh, I'm not exactly sure, um, what's going on. This is going to be a little bit of a weird lecture because it's not, it's more in depth than where I would start with explaining counterplans to a novice, but it's also not so advanced that it contains everything you need to know. I think it's a good start and it'll indicate to you a bunch of other things for you to um, uh, then go off and explore and learn on your own. But uh, mainly, I just kind of want to like clarify some things and uh, fix some misconceptions among the people who do know a lot, a little bit about counterplans or feel like they know about counterplans. And uh, yeah, that's really my goal here. So here is like a little layout of what we're going to talk about and uh hopefully we accomplish that so counter plans are a product of debate theory and i just wanted to real quick like explain like debate theory like there's no rule that says like counter plans um are a thing and and it's not like one day someone was like hey the negative is allowed to run a counter plan let's add that into the rules Debate theory is the logical consequences, like logic, like formal logic, like if A then B, where you take a set of rules and norms for debate and goals and whatever, and then you uh, put them in different scenarios or uh, the interplay between them will naturally lead to certain uh, consequences that are kind of like objectively true if the premises are true right like if these rules are whatever then this side should be allowed to do that um, and that's kind of how we end up with counterplans and that doesn't mean that like a counterplan is inherently good just because it's technically allowed or it's inherently bad or anything like that right something can be allowed through debate theory and actually not be good for debate uh, either as a, making it a fair game or making it educational or just making it interesting. Um, so I think it's important for people to familiarize themselves with things like counterplans and debate theory, even if you want to debate in a traditional model and not use these advocacies. Because one, I think people have like a very... Um, people who like have a very traditionalist understanding of debate tend to have a lot of misconceptions about like theory driven arguments uh, that are really easy to clear up if you just learn a little bit about it. But additionally, I think it's just important to care and understand about the activity that you do, right? Like, I think if you like really cared about music, you would learn about musical genres and musical styles and concepts and music that aren't directly relevant to the music that you maybe like most or the music that you make. And I kind of feel the same way about debate. So I think this is relevant to everybody. Um, what is a counterplan? A counterplan is a proposal that's made by the negative, but it's kind of more than that, right? So the burdens of debate don't change. Uh, the affirmative is proving the resolution true and the negative is just trying to demonstrate that the affirmative doesn't prove the resolution true but a counterplan allows the negative to do that 
outside of their um, standard role of defending the status quo. So this might not apply in a uh, non-policy topic. A policy topic is where there's an actor taking an action. The uh, United States should increase the minimum wage, right? So in a normal standard round with that topic, the affirmative is defending changing the status quo because they're advocating for increasing the minimum wage and the negative, the, the con team, is defending the status quo because they're saying we shouldn't do that thing that is changing the status quo. Um, a counter plan is not the negative just coming up with their own plan and doing a different affirmative. So in other words, if let's say it's LD or public forum, right? And you uh, have an AF case, but in this uh, round, you are the um, negative. And the affirmative reads a plan, and you're like, you know, my AF case is better than this AF case. A counter plan does not let you just read a better AF case and say, no, this is what we should be doing instead, because it's better than what this affirmative is advocating for. Um, but the point is to, um, not have to defend the status quo. And it's one of the first arguments that, um, at least in something like Parley, maybe in something like uh, College LD, maybe High School LD also, uh, it's one of the first arguments that once you know it, you have a huge advantage over um, teams that don't know it and don't know how to respond to it. And it's the first kind of like big surprise that a lot of our novice debaters get um, because they go in, they learn uh, case structure, maybe they learn a little bit about like solvency and stuff like that, but it's mainly just advantages versus disadvantages. And then one day somebody runs a counter plan and they're just totally blindsided. And uh, I would say after that is probably like topicality, and after that's probably like other procedurals, and after that is like the critique. So that's kind of the order in which I would learn. Um, counter plans. Not because those concepts are too complicated to learn in a different order, but because I think it creates the best like foundations in your debate education in that order. So how does a counter plan work? Well, the in the advantages and disadvantages uh, video, um, as well as just how I give the like introduction to debate lecture the example topic we use is let's get a dog and in a typical debate the affirmative defends taking the action in the res getting a dog and the negative defends uh the status quo not having a dog not getting any pet in a counter plan the negative says let's get a cat instead and there's a few things that we're going to get into that justifies why the um uh, negation gets to do that or like what their justification for making a proposal is but the simple version for now is that if the negative can show we should get a cat it demonstrates that we should not get a dog which is what the um, negative's job is to do so how are they justified? Well, the affirmative has the burden of proof, right? So if they have to prove that we have to get a dog and it's disproven that we have to get a dog because we can accomplish all of those things that we want to do through some other way, then that might be a good reason to not get a dog. Um, the resolution calls for an action and then we like justify uh, counter plans by calling them an opportunity cost and that's kind of the difference between a counter plan and just the negative being an affirmative it think of a um, counter plan as a opportunity cost disadvantage it's not hey here's a different idea let's maybe get a cat it's hey the reason we shouldn't get a dog is that it costs us the opportunity to get a cat and you have to prove that it costs us the opportunity to get a cat. And if you can then demonstrate that getting a cat would be better than getting a dog, the fact that we lose the opportunity to do the better alternative 
is the disadvantage and reason to reject getting a dog. That's how a counterplan works. The affirmative has an advantage in most formats of debate, um, especially in policy um, in policy oriented uh, topics. And when I say they have an advantage, I don't I don't include like um, like theory and K and stuff like that. I just mean in the fundamental like advantage disadvantage model. The affirmative has an advantage, and the most basic advantage they have is, let's say it's a parley round, you get 20 minutes after you hear the topic and you're going to go in and have this debate, and the topic is the United States should increase the minimum wage. Well, the negative doesn't know what the AFS plan is going to do. They have, a, they have an idea, but they don't know um, what they're going to increase it to. Is it going to be $15? Is it going to be $20? $40? twelve dollars they don't know as long as they're increasing it they're topical and they also don't know well are they going to increase it in there's multiple kinds of uh, minimum wage are they going to increase all of the kinds of minimum wage are they going to increase it in some areas are they going to increase it incrementally all at once and there's things that you can do to check back against this with um topicality and stuff like that but just inherently speaking in that scenario the negative can't be sure if their disadvantages will link um but the affirmative knows that the negative is defending the status quo and so they will know exactly uh what um the negative has the ability to weigh against them and what what arguments they should probably be preparing for counter plans uh, shake that up, make it a little bit more even, make it so that it's, uh, that the negative side has more options. And we're going to talk about when to take those options, when not to take those options, but that's the strategic idea behind like why they are good for debate because they make the game a little bit more fair that way. And lastly, counter plans are probably kind of real world, right? Like when we're talking about policy proposals in the real world, take healthcare, right? We're not just saying, hey, um, let's pass Bernie Sanders's Medicare for all bill or do absolutely nothing. We have multiple versions of a bill. There's multiple Medicare for alls. There's multiple alternatives. Hey, let's just increase who gets Medicare or let's try to uh, do some other thing with healthcare. And when a bill does get proposed, it gets um, modified and changed all, all, all sorts of ways, right? So um, analyzing the aspects of a plan and debating whether all of it's necessary or all of it's good uh, or the specific way it's being implemented is the most effective way of doing it probably has some real world parallels. Um, there's ways in which those parallels don't apply to counter plans, but we'll probably get into that too. So what are the strategic goals behind a counter plan? What are you, how should you incorporate them into your strategy? And the answer for that really is that you should only do it when you're defending the status quo. And this isn't like a widely held view. This is Sasan Kesravi, um, and I think Paul agrees with this, only ever run a counter plan when you're defending, when you can't defend the status quo. And what I mean by that is when it's you don't feel that it's possible for you to win with just disadvantages. And I'll get into why a little bit later. The strategy behind like what kind of counter plan you run, what are you trying to do with that counter plan now that you're avoiding defending the status quo, is you're trying to steal affirmative ground. Uh, in other words, you're not trying to come up with, hey, here's a whole bunch of benefits to my counter plan, and let's now compare that to the benefits of the AF plan. What you're trying to do is just take the benefits that they said and say, hey, my counter plan does that stuff too. We reach those same impacts through the counter plan. And the reason we do that, it relates to um, what it says right there, which is, so let's imagine we didn't do that. 
we have the affirmative plan, and then we have, you know, all the stuff in the topic case around the plan. And then we have advantage one, let's say advantage two. And they each have impacts which could determine the round, could not determine the round, but they could each be the most important thing in the round. And then the negative comes up and they have, let's say, a disadvantage and a disadvantage to the plan. And then they have a counter plan and that counter plan doesn't do any of the affirmative's advantages and there is an advantage to the counter plan. Well, now you have a really messy debate, really complicated debate. And while having complicated debates makes debaters feel smart and they feel like, I don't know, that good debaters have complicated rounds because they're very advanced or something, like that's not really, uh, in my mind, what makes for good debating because you're always limited by your judges. Your job is to convince a judge to vote for you. And that judge should ideally um, make a decision that you can predict and control. And what happens when you have so many factors is that when there's 12, 20, or more ways a judge could make a decision, then the chances that you're going to be able to uh, control how they make that decision is very low. And that's how you end up with like judges that you feel screwed you over or that were bad judges or whatever, right? Um, the much more effective way is narrowing down the focus of the debate and and counter plans do that really well. So now let's say instead we have a AF plan and a uh, advantage one, advantage two, and the negative comes up and says, um, here's something we don't like about the affirmative's plan. Here's a counter plan. It does all of the same stuff that the affirmative does, which is, you know, advantage one, advantage two. It does all of that but it avoids this disadvantage that we uh, are talking about. Now, there's only one question, maybe two, left in the debate. Like, is the counter plan legitimate? And two, like, is the disadvantage real? So in other words, like, does this counter plan do all the exact same things as the affirmative? And does it avoid this other problem? Is that problem real? And if you can just prove those things, it's a very clean vote for the negative. Whereas if you're trying to introduce a counter plan just to introduce more advocacies, it doesn't push other arguments out of the round. Um, but capturing advantages saying, hey, we do all that same stuff does push those out of the round because now they're not a source of controversy. You both agree that those advantages are good. You're just both claiming them. Uh, and that's, I guess, what that was about to say, simplifying the round. Uh, okay, so let's get to what a counterplay actually looks like now, uh, 20 minutes into this video. There's four parts. They don't have to happen in this exact order. Uh, the first is the counterplan text. The counterplan text is when you're explaining what the counterplan is. What does this counterplan do? The second part is mutual exclusivity. Sometimes people call it like competition or something like that. And this demonstrates that you cannot do the affirmative plan and the counter plan uh, together at the same time. Um, mutual exclusivity is technically not necessary and we'll get into that most good counter plans actually aren't mutually exclusive but there still needs to be an opportunity cost um so i'll get into that in just a minute but the third thing is solvency now the solvency can explain how, what how the counter plan works what it does so like let's say your counter plan text is um pass, you know, Senate Bill 260, um, the solvency might be where you explain what that actually does, 
But um, another thing that you do want to usually, always, uh, do with your solvency portion of the counterplan structure is explain how this counterplan solves for the affirmative. Later, you'll probably go uh, on case, and when you're talking about those advantages, reiterate that they are captured by the counterplan, but the solvency section is a great place for you to mention how you uh, capture the affirmatives, impacts, links, whatever. And then the last thing is going to be a reason to prefer. Now, let's say these um, counterplans are totally mutually exclusive. Um, then at this point, you're left with like, hey, here's what I think we should do. Here's why it's just fundamentally different from what the affirmative is doing. And here's how it works. And finally, here's why my proposal is better than the affirmative's proposal. If you're doing uh, what we're going to get into, which is a disadvantage counterplan, then your reason to prefer is usually going to be we accomplish all of the same things that the affirmative is accomplishing, but we avoid this disadvantage. That's our reason to prefer. So your counterplan text, <clears throat> I just explained this, but um, a, a lot of times people will want a copy of it, like. Um, like in the if you're doing it online it's in the chat but if you just write it out and hand it to them uh, and this is going to help them respond to the counterplan later right it just makes for um better stuff um so it says here that the counterplan text should be specific even if the counterplan is generic well what does that mean well a generic counterplan means that it is a uh type of counterplan that is done often. So for example, a 50 states counterplan that says whatever it is we're talking about the United States federal government doing, the state governments should do that instead. But your text should still be specific. So in the context of that round, the text should say what it specifically is that the states are doing. This is something that happens a lot in like college LD where people's counterplan text will be like 50 states will do blank and they just never filled in the blank because their coach gave them like the template for a counterplan text a template for a 50 states counterplan but they didn't use prep to like plug in what the affirmatives counterplan text actually is um mutual exclusivity <clears throat> already mentioned this it needs to represent a opportunity cost and uh, here's some ways for it to be fully mutually exclusive so if you're using the same amount of funding you can't spend the same million dollars twice if you um, uh, it could be like a reform thing oh we should remove this law well no we should reform this law like change it it can't be removed and in place at the same time uh, you could have the same time frame can't be two places at the same time these are just some ideas for ways that you can say our counter plan and the affirmative plan can't coexist they can't both be done together but um most cases most useful counter plans um you don't need to resort to this i think um, so solvency, you explain how the counter plan works, you explain how it solves for the F, and strategically it should solve for the affirmative, and yeah, okay, I already said all of this stuff. So um, otherwise you have the same advantage-disadvantage debate as before, right? Because now you're comparing the advantage, the, the F still gets to weigh their advantages, but with a counter plan that captures that advantage, there's nothing to weigh it against. You're both saying that advantage is good. And, um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. So then it just makes it so the only thing that matters is the reason to prefer the counter plan and whether the counter plan is legitimate and so on. Reason to prefer. Um, it's not enough just to solve for the affirmative because there needs to be a reason to prefer the counter plan, right? If there's a counter plan and it does all the same things as the affirmative plan, well, why should I pick? the counterplan you're not 
Like, if they're perfectly even, I'm just going to go with the first plan, especially since you haven't given... You haven't met your, like, burden as the negative, right? Or at least your job as the negative. You haven't given me a reason to reject this thing, right? It's like if the... Um, plan is like the united states i don't know so whatever we should get a dog and the negatives like we should get a dog while we're wearing a blue shirt um there's there's no reason to prefer that it, especially if you don't have any benefits to the blue shirt you're just saying hey but that's still we get a dog um so that can be done a few different ways you could have greater benefits to the counter plan, which is called an advantage counter plan. Here's, uh, if we get a blue shirt instead, then here's the benefits of wearing a blue shirt. That's even better. Uh, or you could say there's fewer costs, which is what I was talking about earlier, which is called the disadvantage counter plan. Hey, here's this problem with the plan. Um, let's do this other thing instead that avoids that problem. So we're talking about avoiding a problem or adding a benefit. Generally speaking, I very strongly recommend the disadvantage counter plan over the advantage counter plan because they are much more difficult to um, answer. Um, advantage counter plans can be very easy to perm, but we'll get to that in a minute too. Disadvantage counter plans, they're not strictly mutually exclusive. In theory, they can be done at the same time. So, um, what you want to do is you want to run a disadvantage that links to the plan but not the counter plan. That's super important. You don't want your DA to link to your counter plan because then that takes away the reason to prefer. So let's imagine that we're doing the let's get a dog situation and you're saying, hey, um, cool, cool, cool. Dogs need companionship. That's awesome. Uh, but here's a disadvantage. I am allergic to dogs. Um, so let's get a cat. It's still just as good company. It's still, you know, uh, actually I'm told this isn't true. But let's imagine. So it accomplishes all the companionship um, advantages of getting a dog, but it avoids the allergy disadvantage. And that becomes the reason to prefer getting a cat. Now, that's not mutually exclusive. You can get a dog and get a cat. But in a world where you do both, the disadvantage still happens. So it's like, okay, we get a dog and we get a cat, but then I still have allergies. So this makes the world of the negative preferable to the world of the perm, which I'll explain what that means, but doing the AF and the counter plan. So even though there's no opportunity cost exactly in the sense that we can't, getting a dog doesn't stop us from also getting a cat, only the world in which we just get a cat avoids the disadvantage of the allergies, which means if you can make the allergies be the most significant issue in the round, then that's it, it's, it's, it's game over. So uh, these are uh, protected from perms unless you lose the disadvantage, right? If you lose the, um, uh, the allergies disadvantage, then there's now no longer a reason to get a dog and a cat. And I'll get into the perm. That doesn't even mean that the affirmative has to say getting a cat is good. All they would need to show is this means that us getting a dog doesn't preclude the option for us to get a cat so that's not a reason to reject getting a dog um and it makes the focus of the debate the disadvantage so let's say your disadvantage is solid but it's not enough to outweigh the affirmative right so in this case the companionship thing right the advantage the advantage is yo i'm so lonely i'm about to end it all and the only disadvantage you can come up with is I'm allergic to dogs. Well, you're not going to win with that because the status quo sucks. And most judges are going to be like, yeah, I think sniffles are worth it if the option is like, uh, you know, <laughs> suicide level loneliness. So what you want is to take out 
that factor from the equation and make it instead just about, well, okay, we're going to get rid of this loneliness issue one way or the other. So the question is, like, do we care about the allergies? And uh, is the allergy a real thing? If we can accomplish the same thing while avoiding the allergies, why wouldn't we? So that's what I mean by it puts the focus on the disadvantage. And if you lose the disadvantage, you lose the entire debate because you can no longer defend the status quo because you ran a counter plan, unless it's conditional. But we'll get to that at the end of the video. Uh, so if you win the DA, you win the whole round. If you lose the DA, you lose the whole round. And this is a very risky thing. It puts all your eggs in one basket, which is why I say don't run a counter plan unless you cannot win with disadvantages. Because if you can win with disadvantages, then just read two disadvantages and whatever other strategy you want and give yourselves give yourself options in the back half. If you read a counter plan, then you don't really have options. The round's going to go in a very specific way, and it just is a risk. So here's some common counter plans. There's uh, agent counter plans, which change who does the plan. And generally speaking, when you're reading a counter plan, you want to prepare a untopical counter plan. What does that mean? That means that your counter plan is not something that the affirmative could run as their AF plan. So if it says the USFG should increase the minimum wage or should, I don't know, let's pick something else that uh, the USFG should um, offer uh, a stimulus for everybody, right? Create a stimulus. Um, the affirmative does not get to defend some other organization doing it. They don't get to come in, not use the USFG. So an agent counter plan is safe because you know that's not what their AF plan is going to be. If you pick a topical counter plan, like, oh, they're... They're going to increase the minimum wage and you're like, okay, so my counter plan is increase it to this amount instead. Then you don't necessarily know that that's not what the AF plan is. So like, let's say you assume they're going to increase it to 15. So you say increase it to 20, but they come in and they read 20, then you have nothing. So it's always safer and more strategic to prepare something based on what the affirmative cannot do. So what are they stuck with based on the resolution? And is there something that they are stuck with that you can change that makes it a more effective way of doing this? So going from the United States, the United Nations is one option for a lot of topics. Going from the federal government to state governments is um, an option. Going from the public sector to the private sector is an option for a lot of topics. But because of this, um, experienced debaters will have a bunch of UN bad arguments that they just have memorized and uh, 50 states counter plans bad or like either either as theory or just as like here's why it doesn't solve as well or private sector is not as good, right? So that's kind of like the back and forth of the game, right? Um, so another one is delay. Uh, it's presumed or usually it's not a presumption, but okay. The affirmative will always try to make their plan happen as soon as it can happen. Um, why? Because if you didn't do that and there isn't a good reason why it can't happen sooner, then the negative could read a counter plan that says do it now and they would win, right? Because they're just factually speaking like it's better to do stuff sooner unless there's a reason not to right so because of that the affirmative is forced into reading the plan happening as soon as it can happen uh without like major problems and you can look for reasons why we might delay it farther than that maybe some problem with doing it now that they didn't consider uh, maybe we have like an election coming up or maybe there's some sort of pandemic maybe affecting the entire planet. Um, 
there's consult counter plans. I don't like them. Um, a consult counter plan says, do the affirmative, but before doing the affirmative, we should ask this group how they feel about us doing the affirmative. And the problem that I don't, uh, the problem that I have with them is that I don't think that the negative gets to defend that the people they consult approve of the counter plan right of, approve of the affirmative right so if it's like hey the united states should build a pipeline and the negatives like okay but like native groups have been really upset about stuff like this before and they've never been consulted and here's a disadvantage to disenfranchising them by not involving them in the process so the counter plan is the united states should consult native tribes and then build the pipeline but but you don't get to like what if they say no like what if they're like no we don't want this pipeline will is the negative willing to defend the benefits we get from having asked even though they said no versus the like costs of not having that pipeline in the case of a pipeline probably fine for the negative to be like yeah it's it's better to not have that pipeline but then just read disadvantages to the pipeline uh, but in the case of other things that just are objectively good ideas, you're going to have a hard time winning, assuming like the people you're consulting say no. So a lot of times people will be like, oh, they'll say yes, which is like, if you're so sure they'll say yes, then doesn't that just hurt the premise of why we're asking them? Like, sounds like they've been consulted. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, an alternative policy, we talked about like uh, universal basic income versus nearly universal basic income, which is like a same thing but affects if, you, if you're rich, you don't get it. Um, and nearly universal basic income is touching on a PIC, a plan inclusive counter plan, which is my favorite kind of counter plan and the type of counter plan that my team runs the most often. So a pick is where the counter plan includes all or some of what the affirmative is doing. The example of let's get a dog, no, let's get a cat is not a pick, but a, a pick will be um, either plan plus or plan minus so let's get a dog and do this or let's get a dog except let's not do this part and don't do plan plus is the is the short version because it's not mutually exclusive right if if my plan is let's get a dog and then your plan is let's get a dog and a dog house there's no reason why getting a dog would stop us from getting a dog house, even though I didn't particularly, like specifically mention the dog house, right? But um, if instead it's like, let's get a dog except, uh, wow, this is, you can't get like part of the dog removed. I don't think they let you. But if it's like, okay, let's um, increase the minimum wage except for people working in the oil industry, um, then that is doing most of what the affirmative is doing, but taking some part out. And here's a, here's a hot take for you. Um, is an exemption plan plus or plan minus like that, that, example I just gave like there's there's good examples of plan minus right like there's um, uh, like the United States should give a stimulus to everybody um, you you should say so you could say like the United States should give a stimulus to everybody except um, a lower amount right that's a plan inclusive counter plan uh, because it contains most of the same stuff, but it's a little bit different. Or it could be like, oh, let's, uh, if the plan is like, um, uh, the United States should send um, 
economic aid to every country in the world and you're like we should send it to every country in the world except i don't know whatever chechnya is not a country um uh then that would be a plan inclusive counter plan but if i'm talking about like let's um increase the minimum wage except for this job like that would be a bill right that would be a legal like a like a like a law like a bill that would have to be written and an exemption is something that's added to that bill like they add a paragraph that says except in blah 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 and those exemptions are oftentimes added later so is it plan minus to say let's do your bill ex with an exception for this adding an exemption for this i don't think so i think that to me that sounds plan plus right because you're adding an exemption in text you're adding text so i clearly it doesn't cost us the opportunity of later adding text just a hot take um a disadvantage counter plan is the best way to do a pick uh, because you just run a disadvantage about the part you're not including and then say, hey, I'm doing all your stuff except this part that is bad. Um, so when do you run counter plans? As I, uh, well, this is not the first thing. Obviously, make sure your judge is receptive to counter plans, right? It doesn't, like, you have to adapt to your judges. It's not going to do you any good if the judge is just like, for whatever reason, I hate counter plans. And you're like, here's a counter plan. Um, only run it when you can't defend the status quo. And um, this assumes that your counter plan is unconditional, which is what I recommend. And I'll probably talk a little bit about conditionality at the end. Oh, cool. Here's the new thing I made. And this is why, like, see, now I can kind of, like, get out of the way. Um, so this is a chart I made, which is a rough approximation of how I decide whether or not to run a counter plan and what kind of counter plan I decide to run. And you have to keep in mind that we are um, normally uh, competing in parliamentary debate. And in parliamentary debate, you got 15, 20 minutes to write an entire case, which means you got two, three minutes to figure out what the topic's like about. And then two, three minutes after that to just pick a strategy what are we running this round and then the rest of it's going to be spent reading and research researching furiously writing those cases so you don't you have very little time um to pick a strategy so here's what that kind of looks like for me um i can put this as a separate like imager something and then put it in the description below but the first thing first can we defend the status quo? If yes, we're not running a counter plan. Uh, if no, is it a whole law res? A whole law res is something that's like the United States federal government should pass Senate Bill 8000. That means that the affirmative has to, they don't get to choose how to implement the topic. They must pass this bill and every provision that it contains. Um, let's right now assume that it's not that. So what's an example of a resolution that is not a whole law res? That could be increase the minimum wage. Now, they would increase the minimum wage by passing a law, but what that law looks like is not stated in the resolution which means that the affirmative has more options basically the reason this matters is because there's theory that is commonly read against picks that say if it's a a whole law res you should not be allowed to read a plan inclusive counter plan why because if it if the thing that you are um, cutting out of the affirmative's advocacy was something that they chose to have in there, that they could have not included in their plan, but they uh, just weren't aware of it, and they've now effectively advocated for something that you find a problem with, then it's more fair. But if the 
Medicare for All, and it's like 3,000 pages, includes one provision about like how something is taxed for whatever minute way, and then you in prep just read through it and then you're like okay this seem this thing doesn't seem great let's let's read past medicare for all bernie sanders is medicare for all uh but cut out provision 38c dot j5 um then that's less fair right because uh you can just find any minute thing in this whole law and then magically win now, uh, so now let's say it's just increase the minimum wage. The affirmative can increase it or decrease it. The next question is, is the res bi-directional? So, um, um, directional in this case would be increase. So increase the minimum wage is not bi-directional, uh, but a bi-directional resolution would be the United States should change the minimum wage. Um, that would be bi-directional because the app can increase or decrease. Or a more likely um, uh, bi-directional topic would be something like uh, the United States federal government should reform make, or should make changes to its immigration policy, which is something we've had to debate before. And it's like that sucks because now the negative what what do you what do you defend like you don't know is the affirmative going to be pro immigration anti immigration are they going to be more restrictive are going to be less restrictive do you how do you prepare disadvantages all you can prepare is that the way things happen to be at this exact moment is the way that they should stay forever but also things right now just objectively aren't good with immigration and it's going to be really hard to find any sources that say we should keep things exactly the way they are because affirm because democrats nor republicans are happy with the way things are right now so if it is bi-directional, that just sucks for you, and that is a really bad topic, and then you get to be really grumpy, and you get to complain about the tournament and whoever wrote the topic, and then you get to come up with something. In uh, the case of our open kids, Paul would probably tell them to read a cap K, because uh, what else can they possibly go for? But let's say the res is not bi-directional. Can you find something to cut out of the F? If yeah read that as a pick if no okay does the uh res have uh is there are, are they the only actor that can do this thing and i actually forgot to add a yes to this so no if they're not the only actor just read an actor counter plan if they are the only actor that can do that then maybe i don't know come up with something else um okay now let's imagine it is a whole law res is there alternative law proposed Yes. Okay. Is it competitive? So something like um, past this uh, Andrew Yang's UBI policy, is there an alternative? Yeah. And UBI has been uh, proposed. Is it competitive? Yeah. There's, there's, they, you can't have both, right? You can't, your universal basic income can't be nearly universal and universal. Um, so then just read a disadvantage counter plan or an advantage counter plan, but I recommend a disadvantage counter plan. If it's not competitive, like, um, I don't know, uh, we should, uh, with the child care topic, we should make child care universal. And then somebody's like, here's a proposal for a child tax credit. You can, you can have, you can have free daycare and a tax credit you you, you uh yeah, that's actually was written over here um there's uh there's an old episode of freakazoid uh freakazoid has a uh friend who um is a cop uh and uh i think his name is clarence and he goes clarence how come you never got married and he goes ah just i like eating meat too much and freakazoid says you can be married and still eat a lot of meat. And he goes, ah, I didn't know that. And that's how I feel about counter plans all the time. You can be married and still eat a lot of meat. You can pass 
the daycare bill and still have a child tax credit. So what can you do? It's over here. I'll post the whole thing. But um, a disadvantaged counterplan is the best thing that you can do. And then a bunch of answers to perm because they are going to read a perm. Um, because that's the best way uh, to answer that. But what else can you do? You can't defend the status quo. You got to read something. Let's say there's no policy alternatives that you're able to find, um, either in your weeks of preparing for some other format or seconds of preparing for a parliamentary debate. Well, is there a big election coming up? <laughs> if there is, maybe just read some sort of politics this ad. Like, this is not a good time to do this because it's going to affect this election. So let's delay it until after that election. Uh, and if you can't find that either, then just read a pick anyway. And they'll <laughs> read a pick on a whole law res, and you're just going to answer that theory. Um... Yeah, this is a rough approximation, and and it's this isn't this flow chart didn't exist until yesterday, uh, so it's not like this is what I follow when I'm coming up with a counter plan, but it's uh, I think a good rough approximation of probably what's going through my head when I'm preparing a counter plan. So. How do you respond to a counterplan? Well, the first answer is the perm. And um, how are we doing on time? Oh, this will be about an hour. So the word perm is short for permutation, and it refers to the act of like changing something. And there's different kinds of perm, but the usually when we say perm, what we're referring to is perm do both, which is demonstrating that it is not... Um, mutually exclusive that you can be married and still eat a lot of meat now there's a question of whether perm is an advocacy or a test of competition generally speaking people consider perm to be a test of competition what's the difference if it's an advocacy you're saying i reckon i advocate for us doing my initial suggestion and what the counter plan says this can be bad because then what a team can do is they can run a counter plan and they're like, uh, okay, we should increase the minimum wage and we should, um, or, or no, sorry, instead of making increasing the minimum wage, our counter plan is make a $20 uh, donation to the uh, Green Desk Initiative. And the AF comes up and they're like, um, why, we, can, we can do both. So let's just increase the minimum wage and make a $20 donation to the Green Desk Initiative. And then the negative can come up and say, we're not advocating for a counter plan anymore. We're severing from it. But they have advocated for making a $20 uh, donation to the Green Desk Initiative. And actually, the Green Desk Initiative is an organization that, like, finds puppies and punches them. Uh, and so you're now advocating for that, and that's a really bad thing. And other just wacky things that can happen, right? And so the better way of thinking about perms is that, look, the... Affirmative doesn't have to prove that we should do the affirmative plan and the counter plan. All they have to do is show that it is possible to do both. And that is enough because the theoretical grounds of the counter plan are based on it being an opportunity cost, right? That's what allows the negative to have an advocacy in the first place. So beyond the status quo. So... If they can show that there is no opportunity cost, then it doesn't matter what the argument is, it's just not relevant. It's like delinking uh, someone's disadvantage without having to show that their impacts aren't good. Like we're not disagreeing that this, uh, that the environment is super important and that environmental collapse will kill us all. We're just, that's just not something that links into what our AF does. It doesn't, it's not relevant. Uh, so it's think of it as like delinking the opportunity disad, which is actually a counter plan. Uh, there's a couple different kinds of perm though. You can say um, you could 
do the affirmative then the negative. You could do uh, the affirmative in order to do the negative. Those answers are more common when you are talking about a critique uh, than when you're talking about, about a counterplan. Usually the perm that's read for a counterplan is just perm do both. Um, there's other ways of responding to a counterplan. Uh, there is arguing that the parts of the, uh, a lot of times people's bad counterplans won't capture the affirmative, or at least all of the affirmative. And there's, when you're reading a affirmative and you think that the negative is going to read a counterplan, it's really smart to come up with advantages based on things that are like very specific to your actor. So arguments for like why the USFG is key or why now is key, or why do $15 is key, right? So you put those in the case so that when the negative reads a counterplan, whatever they didn't capture, you weigh that against the counterplan and say, look, even if we could do the counterplan instead, because it doesn't capture this one thing and that thing is super duper important vote for the original plan instead so you're essentially um weighing that against the disadvantage whatever the counter plan is using you're using you're weighing it against that and a lot of that can be perception links also right like there will be perceptions that are different based on whether the united states or the united nations or um the 50 states or someone is is doing something right and that's something that is really difficult for a counterplan to capture if you're telling a strong perception story of how specifically your actor making specifically this action in this specific way if you can come up with a reason why that leads to some impact it's going to be really difficult for a counterplan to capture it so for example it can be that some group has been calling for this action to happen. And so you're like, okay, in order to make that group feel enfranchised, we are going to do exactly the thing that they asked for. And that is going to have like an external impact of making that group feel more enfranchised. Um, a counter plan could do a different version, but it's not going to link as strongly into this kind of like enfranchisement impact because you're not doing exactly what that group advocated for like the i don't know NAACP maybe i don't know uh it's not the best argument uh by any means because especially like hard to find evidence for that but even if you could the impacts of it are going to have a hard time weighing very strongly uh but it's something another thing that you could do is um just yeah if, if their counter plan just straight up doesn't capture one of your advantages you just weigh that against it and Hopefully that will be good because hopefully you wrote good advantages. Another thing you could do is read a disadvantage to the counter plan. So whatever like actor they are using, say they switch to the UN, you read all of your like UN peacekeeper bad arguments. Or if they switch to 50 states, you read why like that's bad. Uh, and so that's not just like that's not just the perm right uh and there's also theory like picks bad condo bad no picks on whole law res we don't read any theory that's like counter plans are bad um because we read counter plans uh and we don't run into a theory that says counter plans are bad but i don't know i imagine something like that could happen in high school ld because people just gonna um there's a much wider array of people competing and um, things like that are more likely to happen. Um, I realize now that I didn't actually get Paul's formula for writing a counter plan for this. But it's, uh, man, let's see, how close can I get off the top of my head? It's seven steps. The first thing you want to do when you're answering a counter plan is you want to, hmm, maybe it's not seven steps. All right, any given counter plan, you want to read a perm, even if you don't think the perm makes sense, right? Uh, because if they drop it, then the counter plan goes away. So you read a perm always. Then you um, 
on solvency, read no solvency to the counter plan. You read why the counter plan doesn't capture the affirmative. You read um, disadvantages to the counter plan. We're at four. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I think that's it. I think that's all you need. Um, because a theory sheet would be separate. So when you're on a counter plan, you want to say why it's not, like, why there's no opportunity cost. And then you want to say, here is all the reasons why the counter plan won't work, why it won't, like, function, why it won't solve. Um, then you want to specify, here's the things that my counter plan does that this counter plan does not capture. Uh, oh, you want to try to like link the uh, either link the disadvantage to the counter plan, or talk about how the counter plan doesn't avoid the disadvantage. And one of the ways that that might look is sorry, I was trying to make sure I didn't have a round for this tournament. I'm judging as always. Um, a lot of bad counter plans will have a disadvantage. That is, I'll just. I don't need to be in this anymore, right? Is there another sheet? Oh, wow. I already wrote this. But it's not Paul's formula. Oh, it probably was just a sheet that said, like, how to answer it, and then I changed the heading once I decided to just include whatever. All right. Um, great. That is just a thank you sheet. All right. Let's – I'm going to hop back to normal me. Okay. <clears throat> Um, you want to make sure that your um, that the perm doesn't resolve for the DA. So, what does that mean? Um, if your disadvantage is that getting a dog doesn't make someone in the house happy because they really want a cat, and like they'll be super heartbroken that they don't have a cat, then the perm resolves that, right? Because in the perm, you have a dog and a cat. So what you want is for a disadvantage that happens even if the counter plan happens in a world where the affirmative also happens, right? So your counter plans avoid the disadvantage, but they don't solve the disadvantage, right? It's not like, problem, we don't have a cat, counter plan, get a cat, because then the perm also solves the problem. Hopefully that's really clear, super common, right? We don't want perms that resolve our uh, DAs. We don't want disadvantages that resolve our DAs. We want uh, counter plans that don't link into our DAs, but also don't solve those problems. That way, a perm links into the DA and does not resolve for it. And you get to weigh that against just doing the counter plan. Um, got a little off the rails at the end there, but uh, I don't know, I'm just gonna be honest, like those PowerPoints and stuff are super boring to make and I feel like not that many people watch them. Um, I mean, maybe in the grand scheme of things people do, but, um, I don't know, it's just not as gratifying. Uh, so, um, I'm probably just going to put this up instead of redoing it in a better way. Though, um, yeah, thanks for taking the time. I hope that helps. Ask me questions about counter counterplants and stuff. Oh, I said I would talk about conditionality. I'm not going to go into it uh, very deep. But um, basically, a counter plan can be uh, conditional or unconditional. It can also be dispositional and other things. But what does that mean? Um, if you're reading a disadvantage, then let's say you're reading two disadvantages. What you might do is you might say, yeah, 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 okay, so our second disadvantage isn't very good. We're not going for it. You're right, the links don't work, but we can still win on our first disadvantage, which tells you blah, 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 blah. You can't do that with counter plans, um, generally speaking, because you've already given up defending the status quo. By, by attempting to change the status quo, you've basically conceded that the status quo is not good, 
and that uh, you are going to try to change it with this counter plan. What a conditional counter plan is, is that you basically don't do that. You're like, hey, I'm proposing this counter plan, but I reserve the right to change my mind and go back to defending the status quo anytime I want. Um, there, you could also be dispositional, which as far as I understand it is like being conditional, but based on a specifically prescribed set of circumstances. So uh, instead of just being like, I could at any moment just decide I'm not going for the counter plan, you're saying, no, we are going for the counter plan except in the instance that you read a D-link to our disadvantage. Uh, it can be whatever you want it to be, but you're signaling that to your opponent so that they can't essentially argue that it's unfair because you could at any moment under any condition change whatever. Um, we're getting kind of in the weeds of theory debate and like what is in my opinion kind of wacky stuff and at sort of like the limits of what's like fair and useful and whatever. Um, but yeah, the short answer is that if somebody's conditional with their counter plan, the affirmative will usually read conditionality bad, uh, condo bad, uh, or dispo bad, or whatever, and then the entire debate just becomes about that instead. Because if they win that theory position, they win, because it's a procedural, it's a theory position, and if they lose, then probably they'll lose on the counter plan, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but it just kind of makes... The reason I'm not going super deep into conditional counter plans is because by the time you're reading the conditional counter plan, the actual counter plan itself will have much less of an impact on how uh, the round shakes out. Um, if I posted this video, it's because I figured this was good enough, uh, but I might not. I don't know. But if I did, say hi. And if I didn't, um, how are you watching this?